Sufism Sufism is a branch of Islam, defined by adherents as the inner, mystical dimension of Islam. Others contend that it is a perennial philosophy of existence that predates religion, the expression of which flowered within Islam. Its essence has also been expressed via other religions and meta-religious phenomena. A practitioner of this tradition is generally known as a Sufi. They belong to different Taruq or orders congregations formed around a master, which meet for spiritual sessions, in meeting places known as Zawaiyas, Kankas, or Tek. All Sufi orders trace many of their original precepts from the Islamic prophet Muhammad through his cousin and son-in-law Ali ibn Abi Talib, with the notable exception of the Sunni Naqshbandi order who claim to trace their origins through the first Sunni caliph, Abu Bakr. However, Alvi and Bakhtashi Muslims claim that every Sufi order traces its spiritual lineage back to one of the twelve Imams, the spiritual heads of Islam who were foretold in the Hadith of the Twelve Successors and were all descendants of Muhammad through his daughter Fatima and Ali. Because of this Ali ibn Abi Talib is also called the father of Sufism. Prominent orders include Alvi, Bhaktashi, Mevlavi, Baralawiya, Chishti, Raifali, Kalwati, Naqshbandi, Naimatalohi, Oviasi, Qdiriya Bautchishya, Kadarilia, Kalandarilia, Zawari Kadri, Shadhiliya and Swarawadiliya. The origin of Sufism is also discussed in the book Mystical Dimensions of Islam, by Anne-Marie Skimal. Sufis believe they are practicing Isan, perfection of worship, as revealed by Gabriel to Muhammad, worship and serve Allah as you are seeing him and while you see him not yet truly he sees you. Sufis consider themselves as the original true proponents of this pure original form of Islam. Sufism is opposed by Wahhabi and Salafist Muslims. Classical Sufi scholars have defined Sufism as a science whose objective is the reparation of the heart and turning it away from all else but God. Alternatively, in the words of the Darkawai Sufi teacher Ahmad ibn Jiba, a science through which one can know how to travel into the presence of the Divine, purify one's inner self from filth, and beautify it with a variety of praiseworthy traits. Muslims and mainstream scholars of Islam define Sufism as simply the name for the inner or esoteric dimension of Islam which is supported and complemented by outward or exoteric practices of Islam, such as Islamic law. In this view, it is absolutely necessary to be a Muslim to be a true Sufi, because Sufism's methods are inoperative without Muslim affiliation. In contrast, author Idris Shah states Sufi philosophy is universal in nature its roots predating the rise of Islam and Christianity. Some schools of Sufism in Western countries allow non-Muslims to receive instructions on following the Sufi path. Some Muslim opponents of Sufism also consider it outside the sphere of Islam. Classical Sufis were characterized by their attachment to Dhikr, a practice of repeating the names of God, often performed after prayers, and asceticism. Sufism gained adherence among a number of Muslims as a reaction against the worldliness of the early Umayyad Caliphate, 661-750 CE. Sufis have spanned several continents and cultures over a millennium, originally expressing their beliefs in Arabic, before spreading into Persian, Turkish, Indian languages and a dozen other languages. Etymology Two origins of the word Sufi have been suggested. Commonly, the lexical root of the word is traced to Safa, Zaf, which in Arabic means purity. Another origin is Suf, S-U-W-F, wool, referring to the simple cloaks the early Muslim ascetics wore. The two were combined by the Sufi al Radhabari who said, the Sufi is the one who wears wool on top of purity. Others have suggested that the word comes from the term al Safar, the people of the bench, who were a group of impoverished companions of Muhammad who held regular gatherings of Dhikr. Abd al Karam ibn Huazim Qusheri and ibn Khaldun both rejected all possibilities other than Suf on linguistic grounds. According to the medieval scholar Abu Rayyan al Biruni, the word Sufi is derived from the Greek word Sophia, Sophia, meaning wisdom. Beliefs while all Muslims believe that they are on the pathway to God and hope to become close to God in paradise, after death and after the final judgment, 
Sufis also believe that it is possible to draw closer to God and to more fully embrace the Divine Presence in this life. The chief aim of all Sufis is to seek the pleasing of God by working to restore within themselves the primordial state of Fitra, described in the Quran. In this state nothing one does defies God, and all is undertaken with the single motivation of love of God. A secondary consequence of this is that the seeker may be led to abandon all notions of dualism or multiplicity, including a conception of an individual self, and to realize the divine unity. Thus, Sufism has been characterized as the science of the states of the lower self, the ego, and the way of purifying this lower self of its reprehensible traits, while adorning it instead with what is praiseworthy, whether or not this process of cleansing and purifying the heart is in time rewarded by esoteric knowledge of God. This can be conceived in terms of two basic types of law, FIQH, an outer law concerned with actions, and an inner law concerned with the human heart. The outer law consists of rules pertaining to worship, transactions, marriage, judicial rulings, and criminal law, what is often referred to, broadly, as Qnun. The inner law of Sufism consists of rules about repentance from sin, the purging of contemptible qualities and evil traits of character, and adornment with virtues and good character. The typical early Sufi lived in a cell of a mosque and taught a small band of disciples. The extent to which Sufism was influenced by Buddhist and Hindu mysticism, and by the example of Christian hermits and monks, is disputed, but self-discipline and concentration on God quickly led to the belief that by quelling the self and through loving ardor for God it is possible to maintain a union with the divine in which the human self melts away. Teaching To enter the way of Sufism, the seeker begins by finding a teacher as the connection to the teacher is considered necessary for the growth of the pupil. The teacher, to be considered genuine, must have received the authorization to teach, ijaza, from another master of the way, in an unbroken succession, silsila, leading back to Muhammad. It is the transmission of the divine light from the teacher's heart to the heart of the student, rather than of worldly knowledge transmitted from mouth to ear, that allows the adept to progress. In addition, the genuine teacher will be utterly strict in his adherence to the divine law. According to Muj and Momin one of the most important doctrines of Sufism is the concept of the perfect man, al-Insan al-Kamal. This doctrine states that there will always exist upon the earth a Qutb, pole or axis, of the universe, a man who is the perfect channel of grace from God to man and in a state of wilayah, sanctity, being under the protection of God. The concept of the Sufi Qutb is similar to that of the Shia Imam. However, this belief puts Sufism in direct conflict with Shiism, since both the Qutb, who for most Sufi orders is the head of the order, and the Imam fulfill the role of the purveyor of spiritual guidance and of God's grace to mankind. The vow of obedience to the Sheikh or Qutb which is taken by Sufis is considered incompatible with devotion to the Imam. As a further example, the prospective adherent of the Mevlevi order would have been ordered to serve in the kitchens of a hospice for the poor for 1,001 days prior to being accepted for spiritual instruction, and a further 1,001 days in solitary retreat as a precondition of completing that instruction. Some teachers, especially when addressing more general audiences, or mixed groups of Muslims and non-Muslims, make extensive use of parable, allegory, and metaphor. Although approaches to teaching vary among different Sufi orders, Sufism as a whole is primarily concerned with direct personal experience, and as such has sometimes been compared to other, non-Islamic forms of mysticism, for example, as in the books of Hossein Naz. Scholars and adherents of Sufism are unanimous in agreeing that Sufism cannot be learned through books. To reach the highest levels of success in Sufism typically requires that the disciple live with and serve the teacher for many, many years. For instance, Bahá'u'lláh Naqshband Bukhari, who gave his name to the Naqshbandi order, served his first teacher, Sayyid Muhammad Baba as Samorsi, for 20 years, until as Samorsi died. He subsequently served several other teachers for lengthy periods of time. The extreme arduousness of his spiritual preparation is illustrated by his service, as directed by his teacher, to the weak and needy members of his community in a state of complete humility and tolerance for many years. 
when he believed this mission to be concluded, his teacher next directed him to care for animals, curing their sicknesses, cleaning their wounds, and assisting them in finding provision. After many years of this he was next instructed to spend many years in the care of dogs in a state of humility, and to ask them for support. History Origins Eminent Sufis such as Ali Haji reclaimed that the tradition first began with Ali ibn Abi Talib. Furthermore, Junaid of Baghdad regarded Ali as the sheikh of the principles and practices of Sufism. Practitioners of Sufism hold that in its early stages of development Sufism effectively referred to nothing more than the internalization of Islam. According to one perspective, it is directly from the Quran, constantly recited, meditated, and experienced, that Sufism proceeded, in its origin and its development. Others have held that Sufism is the strict emulation of the way of Muhammad, through which the heart's connection to the divine is strengthened. More prosaically, the Muslim conquests had brought large numbers of Christian monks and hermits, especially in Syria and Egypt, under the rule of Muslims. They retained a vigorous spiritual life for centuries after the conquests, and many of the especially pious Muslims who founded Sufism were influenced by their techniques and methods. According to late medieval mystic Jami, Abd Allah ibn Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya was the first person to be called a Sufi. Important contributions in writing are attributed to Awail Khani, Harm bin Hien, Hassan Basri, and Said ibn al Masib. Ruwaim, from the second generation of Sufis in Baghdad, was also an influential early figure, as was Junaid of Baghdad. A number of early practitioners of Sufism were disciples of one of the two. Sufism had a long history already before the subsequent institutionalization of Sufi teachings into devotional orders, to Raikat, in the early Middle Ages. The Naqshbandi order is a notable exception to general rule of orders tracing their spiritual lineage through Muhammad's grandsons, as it traces the origin of its teachings from Muhammad to the first Islamic caliph, Abu Bakr. Formalization of Doctrine Towards the end of the first millennium CE, a number of manuals began to be written summarizing the doctrines of Sufism and describing some typical Sufi practices. Two of the most famous of these are now available in English translation, the Kashf al-Majib of Hajri, and the Rizla of Qusheri. Two of Imam al-Ghazali's greatest treatises, The Revival of Religious Sciences, and The Alchemy of Happiness, argued that Sufism originated from the Quran and thus was compatible with mainstream Islamic thought, and did not in any way contradict Islamic law, being instead necessary to its complete fulfillment. This became the mainstream position among Islamic scholars for centuries, challenged only recently on the basis of selective use of a limited body of texts. Ongoing efforts by both traditionally trained Muslim scholars and Western academics are making Imam al-Ghazali's works available in English translation for the first time, allowing English-speaking readers to judge for themselves the compatibility of Islamic law and Sufi doctrine. Growth of Influence the rise of Islamic civilization coincides strongly with the spread of Sufi philosophy in Islam. The spread of Sufism has been considered a definitive factor in the spread of Islam, and in the creation of integrally Islamic cultures, especially in Africa and Asia. The Sanusi tribes of Libya and Sudan are one of the strongest adherents of Sufism. Sufi poets and philosophers such as Koja Akhmet Yosoi, Rumi and Atta of Nishapa, c. 1145, c. 1221, greatly enhanced the spread of Islamic culture in Anatolia, Central Asia, and South Asia. Sufism also played a role in creating and propagating the culture of the Ottoman world, and in resisting European imperialism in North Africa and South Asia. Between the 13th and 16th centuries CE, Sufism produced a flourishing intellectual culture throughout the Islamic world, a golden age whose physical artifacts survive. In many places a pious foundation would endow a lodge, known variously as Azalia, Kanka, or Tek, in perpetuity, waqf, to provide a gathering place for Sufi adepts, as well as lodging for itinerant seekers of knowledge. 
the same system of endowments could also pay for a complex of buildings, such as that surrounding the Suleymanai Mosque in Istanbul, including a lodge for Sufi seekers, a hospice with kitchens where these seekers could serve the poor and or complete a period of initiation, a library, and other structures. No important domain in the civilization of Islam remained unaffected by Sufism in this period. Present Current Sufi orders include Atsimiya, Aliens, Biktashi Order, Mevlabai Order, Baralawiya, Chishti, Jarai, Naqshbandi, Naimatalohi, Kadariliya, Kalandariliya, Zawari Kadri, Shadhiliya, Swarawardiya, Ashrafiya and Awazi, Oviasi. The relationship of Sufi orders to modern societies is usually defined by their relationship to governments. Turkey and Persia together have been a center for many Sufi lineages and orders. The Bittashi was closely affiliated with the Ottoman Janissary and is the heart of Turkey's large and mostly liberal Alvi population. It has been spread westwards to Cyprus, Greece, Albania, Bulgaria, Macedonia, Bosnia, Kosovo and more recently to the USA, via Albania. Most Sufi orders have influences from pre-Islamic traditions such as Pythagoreanism, but the Turkic Sufi traditions, including aliens, Biktashi and Mevlabi, also have traces of the ancient Tengrism shamanism. Sufism is popular in such African countries as Morocco and Senegal, where it is seen as a mystical expression of Islam. Sufism is traditional in Morocco but has seen a growing revival with the renewal of Sufism around contemporary spiritual teachers such as Sidi Hamza al Qadri al Bouchishi. Mbuk suggests that one reason Sufism has taken hold in Senegal is because it can accommodate local beliefs and customs, which tend toward the mystical. The life of the Algerian Sufi master Amir Abd al Qadir is instructive in this regard. Notable as well are the lives of Amado Bamba and Hajar Martal in sub-Saharan Africa, and Sheikh Bansar Ashurma and Imam Shamal in the Caucasus region. In the 20th century some more modernist Muslims have called Sufism a superstitious religion that holds back Islamic achievement in the fields of science and technology. A number of Westerners have embarked with varying degrees of success on the path of Sufism. One of the first to return to Europe as an official representative of a Sufi order, and with the specific purpose to spread Sufism in Western Europe, was the Swedish-born wandering Sufi Abd al-Hadi Aqhili, also known as Ivan Agueli. René Guyanan, the French scholar, became a Sufi in the early 20th century and was known as Sheikh Abdul Wad Yahya. His manifold writings defined the practice of Sufism as the essence of Islam but also pointed to the universality of its message. Other spiritualists, such as G.I. Gurdjieff, may or may not conform to the tenets of Sufism as understood by Orthodox Muslims. Other noteworthy Sufi teachers who have been active in the West in recent years include Bor Muhayyad Yodin, Iniat Khan, Nazim al Haknai, Javad Nurbekhsh, Bulent Ralph, Irina Tweedy. Idris Shah, Mu'at Sifarozak, Nadanga and Ali Kianfar. Currently active Sufi academics and publishers include Llewellyn Vaughan Lee, Nuhar Mankela, Abdullah Nouruddin Durki, Ahid Ashraf, Omar Taran and Abdul Hakim Murad. Theoretical Perspectives Traditional Islamic scholars have recognized two major branches within the practice of Sufism, and use this as one key to differentiating among the approaches of different masters and devotional lineages. On the one hand there is the order from the signs to the signifier, or from the arts to the artisan. In this branch, the seeker begins by purifying the lower self of every corrupting influence that stands in the way of recognizing all of creation as the work of God, as God's active self-disclosure or theophany. This is the way of Imam al-Ghazali and of the majority of the Sufi orders. On the other hand there is the order from the signifier to his signs, from the artisan to his works. In this branch the seeker experiences divine attraction, J-A-D-H-B-A, and is able to enter the order with a glimpse of its endpoint, of direct apprehension of the divine presence towards which all spiritual striving is directed. This does not replace the striving to purify the heart, as in the other branch. It simply stems from a different point of entry into the path. This is the way primarily of the masters of the Naqshbandi and Shadili orders. 
Contemporary scholars may also recognize a third branch, attributed to the late Ottoman scholar Said Nursi and explicated in his vast Quran commentary called the Risale i -Nir. This approach entails strict adherence to the way of Muhammad, in the understanding that this want, or sunnah, proposes a complete devotional spirituality adequate to those without access to a master of the Sufi way. Contributions to other domains of scholarship Sufism has contributed significantly to the elaboration of theoretical perspectives in many domains of intellectual endeavor. For instance, the doctrine of subtle centers, or centers of subtle cognition, known as Latafi Sitta, addresses the matter of the awakening of spiritual intuition in ways that some consider similar to certain models of chakra in Hinduism. In general, these subtle centers or latarif are thought of as faculties that are to be purified sequentially in order to bring the seeker's wayfaring to completion. A concise and useful summary of the system from a living exponent of this tradition has been published by Muhammad Amina. Sufi psychology has influenced many areas of thinking both within and outside of Islam, drawing primarily upon three concepts. Jafar al Sadiq, both an imam in the Shia tradition and a respected scholar and link in chains of Sufi transmission in all Islamic sects, held that human beings are dominated by a lower self called the nafs, a faculty of spiritual intuition called the kalb or spiritual heart, and a spirit or soul called ruah. These interact in various ways producing the spiritual types of the tyrant, dominated by nafs, the person of faith and moderation, dominated by the spiritual heart, and the person lost in love for God, dominated by the ruah. Of note with regard to the spread of Sufi psychology in the West is Robert Fridger, a Sufi teacher authorized in the Kalwati Jirai order. Fridger was a trained psychologist, born in the United States, who converted to Islam in the course of his practice of Sufism and wrote extensively on Sufism and psychology. Sufi cosmology and Sufi metaphysics are also noteworthy areas of intellectual accomplishment. Devotional practices The devotional practices of Sufis vary widely. This is because an acknowledged and authorized master of the Sufi path is in effect a physician of the heart, able to diagnose the seeker's impediments to knowledge and pure intention in serving God, and to prescribe to the seeker a course of treatment appropriate to his or her maladies. The consensus among Sufi scholars is that the seeker cannot self-diagnose, and that it can be extremely harmful to undertake any of these practices alone and without formal authorization. Prerequisites to practice include rigorous adherence to Islamic norms, ritual prayer in its five prescribed times each day, the fast of Ramadan, and so forth. Additionally, the seeker ought to be firmly grounded in supererogatory practices known from the life of Muhammad, such as the Sunnah prayers. This is in accordance with the words, attributed to God, of the following, a famous Hadith Qudsi. It is also necessary for the seeker to have a correct creed, actor, and to embrace with certainty its tenets. The seeker must also, of necessity, Turn away from sins, love of this world, the love of company and renown, obedience to satanic impulse, and the promptings of the lower self. The way in which this purification of the heart is achieved is outlined in certain books, but must be prescribed in detail by a Sufi master. The seeker must also be trained to prevent the corruption of those good deeds which have accrued to his or her credit by overcoming the traps of ostentation, pride, arrogance, envy, and long hopes meaning the hope for a long life allowing us to mend our ways later, rather than immediately, here and now. Sufi practices, while attractive to some, are not a means for gaining knowledge. The traditional scholars of Sufism hold it as absolutely axiomatic that knowledge of God is not a psychological state generated through breath control. Thus, practice of techniques is not the cause, but instead the occasion for such knowledge to be obtained, if at all given proper prerequisites and proper guidance by a master of the way. Furthermore, the emphasis on practices may obscure a far more important fact, the seeker is, in a sense, to become a broken person, stripped of all habits through the practice of, in the words of Imam al-Ghazali, solitude, silence, sleeplessness, and hunger. Magic has also been a part of Sufi practice, notably in India. The most famous of all Sufis. Mansur al-Halaj, d. 
922, visited Sindh in order to study Indian magic, where he accepted Hindu ideas of cosmogony and divine descent and also seems to have believed in the transmigration of the soul. The practice of magic intensified during the declining years of Sufism in India when the Sufi orders grew steadily in wealth and in political influence while their spirituality gradually declined and they concentrated on saint worship, miracle working, magic and superstition. DHIKR DHIKR is the remembrance of God commanded in the Quran for all Muslims through a specific devotional act, such as the repetition of divine names supplications and aphorisms from hadith literature and the Quran. More generally, DHIKR takes a wide range and various layers of meaning. This includes DHIKR as any activity in which the Muslim maintains awareness of God. To engage in DHIKR is to practice consciousness of the Divine Presence and Love, or to seek a state of god weariness. The Quran refers to Muhammad as the very embodiment of DHIKR of God. 65 10 to 11. Some types of DHIKR are prescribed for all Muslims and do not require Sufi initiation or the prescription of a Sufi master because they are deemed to be good for every seeker under every circumstance. Some Sufi orders engage in ritualized DHIKR ceremonies, or Sema. Sema includes various forms of worship such as recitation, singing, the most well known being the Kawali music of the Indian subcontinent instrumental music, dance, most famously the Sufi whirling of the Mevla by order, incense, meditation, ecstasy, and trance. Some Sufi orders stress and place extensive reliance upon DHIKR. This practice of DHIKR is called DHIKR -e kulb, invocation of God within the heartbeats. The basic idea in this practice is to visualize the Arabic name of God, Allah as having been written on the disciple's heart. Murakaba The practice of Murakaba can be likened to the practices of meditation attested in many faith communities. The word Murakaba is derived from the same root, RQB, occurring as one of the 99 names of God in the Quran, al rape meaning the vigilant, and attested in verse 4-1 of the Quran. Through Murakaba, a person watches over or takes care of the spiritual heart, acquires knowledge about it, and becomes attuned to the Divine Presence, which is ever vigilant. While variation exists, one description of the practice within a Naqshbandi lineage reads as follows. Visitation In popular Sufism, that is, devotional practices that have achieved currency in world cultures through Sufi influence. One common practice is to visit or make pilgrimages to the tombs of saints, great scholars, and righteous people. This is a particularly common practice in South Asia, where famous tombs include those of Koja Fark, near Kashgar, in China, Lal Shohba's Colander, in Sindh, Ali Hawari and Lahore Bawald in Zikriya in Multan, Pakistan, Moinuddin Chishti in Ajmer, India, Nizamuddin Alia in Delhi, India and Shah Jalil and Silit, Bangladesh. Likewise, in Fez, Morocco, a popular destination for such pious visitation is the Zawiya Moli Idris II and the yearly visitation to see the current Sheikh of the Qadri Bout Kichi Taraka, Sheikh Sidi Hamza al Qadri al Bout Kichi to celebrate the Maulid, which is usually televised on Moroccan national television. Persecution Sufis and Sufism has been subject to destruction of Sufi shrines and mosques, suppression of orders and discrimination against adherents in a number of Muslim countries where most Sufis live. The Turkish Republican state banned all the different Sufi orders and closed their institutions in 1925 after Sufis opposed the new secular order. The Iranian Islamic Republic has harassed Shio Sufi, reportedly for their lack of support for the government doctrine of Vilayat e Fakai, that is, that the supreme Shiite jurist should be the nation's political leader. In most other Muslim countries, attacks on Sufis and especially their shrines has come from some Muslims from the more puritanical schools of thought who believe Sufi practices such as celebration of the birthdays of Sufi saints, and DHIKR, remembrance of God, ceremonies are bitter or impure innovation, and polytheistic, shirk. History during the Safavid era of Iran, 
both the wandering dervishes of low Sufism, and the philosopher ulema of high Sufism came under relentless pressure from power cleric Muhammad Bakai Melisi, d 1110-1699. Melisi, one of the most powerful and influential Twelver Shah ulema of all time, was famous, for among other things, suppression of Sufism, which he and his followers believed paid insufficient attention to Sharia law. Prior to Melisi's rise, Shiism and Sufism had been closely linked. In 1843, the Sanusi Sufi were forced to flee Mecca and Medina and head to Sudan and Libya. Before the First World War there were almost 100,000 disciples of the Mevlevi order throughout the Ottoman Empire. But in 1925, as part of his desire to create a modern, Western-orientated, secular state, Ataturk banned all the different Sufi orders and closed their tekkas. Pious foundations were suspended and their endowments expropriated. Sufi hospices were closed and their contents seized. All religious titles were abolished and dervish clothes outlawed. In 1937, Ataturk went even further, prohibiting by law any form of traditional music, especially the playing of the neigh, the Sufis reed flute. Current attacks In recent years, Sufi shrines, and sometimes Sufi mosques, have been damaged or destroyed in many parts of the Muslim world. Some Sufi adherents have been killed as well. Ali Goma, a Sufi scholar and Grand Mufti of Al-Azhar, has criticized the destruction of shrines and public property as unacceptable. Pakistan Since March 2005, 209 people have been killed and 560 injured in 29 different terrorist attacks targeting shrines devoted to Sufi saints in Pakistan, according to data compiled by the Center for Islamic Research Collaboration and Learning, Circle. At least as of 2010, the attacks have increased each year. The attacks are generally attributed to banned militant organizations of Diobandi or Ali Hadith, Salafi, backgrounds. Primarily Diobandi background according to another source, author John A. Schmidt. Diobandi and Barelvi being the two major subsects of Sunni Muslims in South Asia that have clashed, sometimes violently, since the late 1970s in Pakistan. Although Barelvi are fully described as Sunni Sufis, whether the destruction and death is a result of Diobandi's banned militant organization's persecution of Sufis, Barelvis. In 2005, the militant organizations began attacking symbols of the Borelvi community such as mosques, prominent religious leaders, and shrines. Timeline March 19, a suicide bomber kills at least 35 people and injured many more at the shrine of Barul Kulshar in remote village of Fatipa located in Jal Maxi district of Balochistan. The dead include a Shia and Sunni devotees, May 27. As many as 20 people are killed and 100 injured when a suicide bomber attacks a gathering at Bari Imam Shrine during the annual festival. The dead were mainly Shia. According to the police members of Saipa i Sahaba Pakistan, SSP, and Lashkar i Jam v. LJ, were involved. Saipa i Sahaba Pakistan, SSP, were arrested from Thanda Pani and police seized two hand grenades from their custody, April 11. A suicide bomber attacked a celebration of the birthday of Muhammad, Eid Maulid an Nabi, in Karachi's Naishtar Park organized by the Barelvi Jamaat al Sunnat. Fifty seven died, including almost the entire leadership of the Sunni Tariq. Over 100 were injured. Three people associated with Lashkar i Jam v were put on trial for the bombing. C. Naishtar Park bombing, December 18. The shrine of Abdul Shukud Malang Baba is demolished by explosives. March 3, 10 villagers killed in a rocket attack on the 400 year old shrine of Abu Saeed Baba. Lashkari Islam takes credit. February 17, Agajay shot and killed in Peshawar, the fourth faith healer killed over several months in Pakistan. Earlier, Pasamullah was killed in Swat by the Taliban December 16, 2008. His dead body was later exhumed and desecrated. Parifula was kidnapped from Noshera and his beheaded body was found in Matani area of Peshawar. Payuma Khan was kidnapped from Derloa and his beheaded body was found near Swat. 
Faith healing is associated with Sufi Islam in Pakistan. March 5th, the Shrine of Raman Baba, the most famous Sufi Pashto language poet, raised to the ground by Taliban militants partly because local women had been visiting the shrine. March 8, attack on shrine of famous Sufi poet Raman Baba in Peshawar. The high-intensity device almost destroyed the grave of the Raman Baba and the gates of a mosque, canteen and conference hall situated in the spacious Raman Baba complex. Police said the bombers had tied explosives around the pillars of the tombs, to pull down the mausoleum. May 8, Shrine of Sheikh Omar Baba destroyed. June 12, Mufti Zafra's Ahmed Nariyami killed by suicide bomber in Lahore. A leading Sunni Islamic cleric in Pakistan he was well known for his moderate views and for publicly denouncing the Taliban's beheadings and suicide bombings as un-Islamic. June 22, Taliban militants blow up the Mir Namar Baba shrine in Peshawar. No fatalities reported. July 1, multiple bombings of Data Dabar complex Sufi shrine, in Lahore, Punjab. Two suicide bombers blew themselves up killing at least 50 people and injuring 200 others. October 7, 10 people killed, 50 injured in a double suicide bombing attack on Abdullah Shah Ghazi shrine in Karachi. October 7, the tomb of Baba Fariduddin Ganj Shaka in Pakbatan is attacked. Six people were killed and 15 others injured. October 25, six killed and at least 12 wounded in an attack on the shrine of 12th century saint, Baba Farid Ganj Shakar in Pakpatan, December 14, attack on Ghazi Baba shrine in Peshawar, 3 killed, February 3, remote controlled devices triggered as food is being distributed among the devotees outside the Baba Haidasayan shrine in Lahore, Punjab. At least 3 people were killed and 27 others injured, April 3, Twin suicide attack leaves 42 dead and almost 100 injured during the annual Urs festival at shrine of 13th century Sufi Saint Sakyazar War, aka Ahmed Sultan, in the Dera Ghazi Khan district of Punjab province. Tariq e Taliban Pakistan, TTP, claims responsibility for the attack. June 21, bomb kills three people and injures 31 others at the Pinza Piran shrine in Hazur Kwani in Peshawar. A police official said the bomb was planted in a donkey cart that went off in the afternoon when a large number of people were visiting the popular shrine. Kashmir, India In this predominantly Muslim, traditionally Sufi region, some six places of worship have been either completely or partially burnt in mysterious fires in several months leading up to November 2012. The most prominent victim of damage was the Dastagir Sahib Sufi Shrine in Srinagar which burned in June 2012, injuring 20. While investigators have so far found no sign of arson, according to journalist Amir Rana the fires have occurred within the context of a surging Salafi movement which preaches that Kashmiri tradition of venerating the tombs and relics of saints is outside the pale of Islam. Somalia under the Al-Shabaab rule in Somali, Sufi ceremonies were banned and shrines destroyed. As the power of Al-Shabaab has waned, however, Sufi ceremonies are said to have re-emerged. Mali In the ancient city of Timbuktu, sometimes called the City of 333 Saints, UNESCO reports that as many as half of the city's shrines have been destroyed in a display of fanaticism, as of July 2012. A spokesman for Ansardine has stated that the destruction is a divine order, and that the group had plans to destroy every single Sufi shrine in the city, without exception. In Gao and Kidal, as well as Timbuktu, Salafi Islamists have destroyed musical instruments and driven musicians. Music is not haram under Sufi Islam, into economic exile away from Mali. International Criminal Court Chief Prosecutor for Tobin Sada described the Islamists' actions as a war crime. Egypt A May 2010 ban by the Ministry of Al Religious Endowments, of centuries-old Sufi Dhikr gatherings, devoted to the remembrance of God, and including dancing and religious songs, has been described as another victory for extreme Salafi thinking at the expense of Egypt's moderate Sufism. 
clashes followed at Cairo's Al Hussein Mosque and Al Sayed Zainab mosques between members of Sufi orders and security forces who forced them to evacuate the two shrines. In 2009, the Mulid of Al Sayed Zainab, Muhammad's granddaughter, was banned ostensibly over concern over the spread of swine flu but also at the urging of Salafis. According to Gabar Qasim, deputy of the Sufi orders, approximately 14 shrines have been violated in Egypt since the January 2011 revolution. According to Sheikh Turkel Rafai, head of the Rafai Sufi order, a number of Salafis have prevented Sufi prayers in Al Haram. Sheikh Rafai said that the order's lawyer has filed a report at the Al Haram police station to that effect. In early April 2011, a Sufi march from Al Azhar Mosque to Al Hussein Mosque was followed by a massive protest before Al Hussein Mosque, expressing outrage at the destruction of Sufi shrines. The Islamic Research Center of Egypt, led by Grand Imam of Al Azhar Ahmed Al Tayb, has also renounced the attacks on the shrines. According to the Muslim Brotherhood website iconweb.com, in 2011 a memorandum was submitted to the armed forces citing 20 encroachments on Sufi shrines. Libya Following the overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi, several Sufi religious sites in Libya were deliberately destroyed or damaged. In the weeks leading up to September 2012, armed groups motivated by their religious views attacked Sufi religious sites across the country, destroying several mosques and tombs of Sufi religious leaders and scholars. Perpetrators were described as groups that have a strict Islamic ideology where they believe that graves and shrines must be desecrated. Libyan Interior Minister Fawzi Abdel Ayal, was quoted as saying, If all shrines in Libya are destroyed so we can avoid the death of one person, then that is a price we are ready to pay. In September 2012, three people were killed in clashes between residents of RAJMA, 50 kilometers southeast of Benazi and Salafist Islamists trying to destroy a Sufi shrine in RAJMA, the Sidi al-Lafi mausoleum. In August 2012 the United Nations Cultural Agency UNESCO urged Libyan authorities to protect Sufi mosques and shrines from attacks by Islamic hardliners, who consider the traditional mystical school of Islam heretical. The attack have wrecked mosques in at least three cities and desecrated many graves of revered Sufi scholars. Tunisia. In an article on the rise of Salafism in Tunisia, the media site El Monitor reported that 39 Sufi shrines were destroyed or desecrated in Tunisia, from the 2011 revolution to January 2013. Russia, Dagestan Sedat Save, also known as Sheikh Sedafundi al Cherkavi, a prominent 74 year old Sufi Muslim spiritual leader in Jestan, Russia was killed by a suicide bombing August 28, 2012 along with six of his followers. His murder follows similar religiously motivated killings in Jestan and other regions of ex-Soviet Central Asia, targeting religious leaders, not necessarily Sufi, who are hostile to violent jihad. Afandi had survived previous attempts on his life and was reportedly in the process of negotiating a peace agreement between the Sufis and Salafis. Iran. The book Mystic Regimes Sufism and the State in Iran, from the late Qajar era to the Islamic Republic by Mathis van den Bos discusses the status of Sufism in Iran in the 19th and 20th century. According to Said Mustafa Azmaesh, an expert on Sufism and the representative of the Naimatul Ulhi order outside Iran, a campaign against the Sufis in Iran, or at least Shio Sufis began in 2005 when several books were published arguing that because Sufis follow their own spiritual leaders do not believe in the Islamic State's principle of vilayat e faqai that is, that the supreme Shiite jurist should be the nation's political leader, Sufis should be treated as second-class citizens. They should not be allowed to have government jobs, and if they already have them, should be identified and fired. Since 2005 the Naimat al order, Iran's largest Sufi order, have come under increasing state pressure. Three of their houses of worship have been demolished. Officials accused the Sufis of not having building permits and of narcotics possession, charges the Sufis reject. The government of Iran is considering an outright ban on Sufism, 
according to the 2009 Annual Report of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. It also reports. In 2009 the mausoleum of the 19th century Sufi poet Nasir Ali and an adjoining Sufi prayer house were bulldozed. Not all Sufis in Iran have been subject to government pressure. Sunni dervish orders, such as the Qadari dervishes, in the Sunni populated parts of the country are thought by some to be seen as allies of the government against Al Qaeda. Islam and Sufism Sufism and Islamic Law Scholars and adherents of Sufism sometimes describe Sufism in terms of a threefold approach to God as explained by a tradition, hadith, attributed to Muhammad, the canon is my word, the order is my deed and the truth is my interior state. Sufis believe the Sharia, exoteric canon, tariq, esoteric order and haqqiq, truth are mutually interdependent. The tariq, the path on which the mystics walk, has been defined as the path which comes out of the Sharia, for the main road is called branch, the path, tariq. No mystical experience can be realized if the binding injunctions of the Sharia are not followed faithfully first. The tariq, however, is narrower and more difficult to walk. It leads the adept, called Salik or Wayfarer, in his suluk or road through different stations, Makamat, until he reaches his goal, the perfect Tawid, the existential confession that God is one. Sheikh al Akbar Muhaddin ibn Arabi mentions when we see someone in this community who claims to be able to guide others to God, but is remiss in but one rule of the sacred law, even if he manifests miracles that stagger the mind, asserting that his shortcoming is a special dispensation for him, we do not even turn to look at him, for such a person is not a sheik, nor is he speaking the truth, for no one is entrusted with the secrets of God Most High save one in whom the ordinances of the sacred law are preserved. Jami Karamat El Alia The Aman Message a detailed statement issued by 200 leading Islamic scholars in 2005 in Amman, and adopted by the Islamic world's political and temporal leaderships at the organization of the Islamic Conference Summit at Mecca in December 2005, and by six other international Islamic scholarly assemblies including the International Islamic FIQH Academy of Jeddah, in July 2006, specifically recognized the validity of Sufism as a part of Islam. However the definition of Sufism can vary drastically between different traditions, what may be intended is simple tizkai as opposed to the various manifestations of Sufism around the Islamic world. Traditional Islamic Thought and Sufism The literature of Sufism emphasizes highly subjective matters that resist outside observation, such as the subtle states of the heart. Often these resist direct reference or description with a consequence that the authors of various Sufi treatises took recourse to allegorical language. For instance, much Sufi poetry refers to intoxication, which Islam expressly forbids. This usage of indirect language and the existence of interpretations by people who had no training in Islam or Sufism led to doubts being cast over the validity of Sufism as a part of Islam. Also, some groups emerged that considered themselves above the Sharia and discussed Sufism as a method of bypassing the rules of Islam in order to retain salvation directly. This was disapproved of by traditional scholars. For these and other reasons, the relationship between traditional Islamic scholars and Sufism is complex and a range of scholarly opinion on Sufism in Islam has been the norm. Some scholars, such as al-Ghazali, helped its propagation while other scholars opposed it. W. Chichik explains the position of Sufism and Sufis this way. Traditional and Neo-Sufi Groups The traditional Sufi orders, which are in majority, emphasize the role of Sufism as a spiritual discipline within Islam. Therefore, the Sharia, traditional Islamic law, and the Sunnah are seen as crucial for any Sufi aspirant. One proof traditional orders assert is that almost all the famous Sufi masters of the past caliphates were experts in Sharia and were renowned as people with great iman, faith, and excellent practice. Many were also qadis, Sharia law judges, in courts. They held that Sufism was never distinct from Islam and to fully comprehend and practice Sufism one must be an observant Muslim. Neo-Sufism 
and universal Sufism are terms used to denote forms of Sufism that do not require adherence to Sharia, or a Muslim faith. The terms are not always accepted by those it is applied to. The universal Sufism movement was founded by Inyat Khan, teaches the essential unity of all faiths, and accepts members of all creeds. Sufism reoriented is an offshoot of Khan's Western Sufism influenced by the syncretistic teacher Maya Baba. The Golden Sufi Center exists in England, Switzerland and the United States. It was founded by Llewellyn Vaughan Lee to continue the work of his teacher Irina Tweedy, herself a disciple of the Hindu Naqshbandi Sufi by Saib. The Afghan Scottish teacher Idris Shah has been described as a neo-Sufi by the Gurdjieffi and James Moore. Other Western Sufi organizations include the Sufi Foundation of America and the International Association of Sufism. Western Sufi practice may differ from traditional forms, for instance having mixed gender meetings and less emphasis on the Quran. Prominent Sufis Abd al-Qadir al-Jalani Al Sayyid Muayyuddin Abu Muhammad Abdul Qadir al Jalani al Hassani Wal Husseini, born 11 Rabi al Thani, 470 Hari, in the town of Naif, district of Jilan, Ilam province or Amal of Tabestan, Persia, died 8 Rabi al Awl 561 AH, in Baghdad, 1077 1166 CE, was a Persian Hanbali jurist and Sufi based in Baghdad. Qadiriya was his patronym. Al-Jalani spent his early life in Naif, the town of his birth. There, he pursued the study of Hanbali law. Abu Ali al-Makhami gave Al-Jalani lessons in Fiqh. He was given lessons about Hadith by Abu Bakr ibn Muzaffar. He was given lessons about Tafsir by Abu Muhammad Jeva, a commentator. In Tazawuf, his spiritual instructor was Abul Qair Hamad ibn Muslim al-Dabas. After completing his education, Jalani left Baghdad. He spent 25 years as a reclusive wanderer in the desert regions of Iraq. In 1127, Al Jalani returned to Baghdad and began to preach to the public. He joined the teaching staff of a school belonging to his own teacher, Al Makharami, and was popular with students. In the morning, he taught Hadith and Tafsir, and in the afternoon, he held discourse on the science of the heart and the virtues of the Quran. He was said to have been a convincing preacher and converted numerous Jews and Christians. His strength came in the reconciling of the mystical nature of the Sufi and strict nature of the Quran. He felt it important to control egotism and worldliness and submission to God. Abul Hazan al Shadili Abul Hassan al Shadili died 1258 CE, the founder of the Shadhiliya Sufi order, introduced Dhikrjari, the method of remembering Allah through loud means. Sufi orders generally preach to deny oneself and to destroy the ego self, nafs, and its worldly desires. This is sometimes characterized as the order of patience to Reich's SABR. In contrast, Imam Shadili taught that his followers need not abstain from what Islam has not forbidden, but to be grateful for what God has bestowed upon them. This notion, known as the order of gratitude to Reich Shukr, was espoused by Imam Shadili. Imam Shadili gave 18 valuable HIZBS, litanies, to his followers out of which the notable Hutzbal Bar is recited worldwide even today. Bayezid Bastami Bayezid Bastami, died 874 CE, is considered to be of the six bright stars in the firmament of the Prophet, and a link in the golden chain of the Naqshbandi Tariqa. He is regarded as the first mystic to openly speak of the inhalation, Fana of the base self in the divine, whereby the mystic becomes fully absorbed to the point of becoming unaware of himself or the objects around him. Every existing thing seems to vanish, and he feels free of every barrier that could stand in the way of his viewing the remembered one. In one of these states, Bastami cried out, Praise to me, for my greatest glory. His belief in the unity of all religions became apparent when asked the question, How does Islam view other religions? His reply was all are vehicles and a path to God's divine presence. Ibn Arabi Muyyidin Muhammad b. Ali ibn Arabi, or Ibn al-Arabi, 
AH 561 AH 638, July 28 1165, November 10 1240, is considered to be one of the most important Sufi masters, although he never founded any order, Tariq. His writings, especially Al Futunat al Makiyah and Fusus al Hikam, have been studied within all the Sufi orders as the clearest expression of Tawid, divine unity, though because of their recondite nature they were often only given to initiates. Later those who followed his teaching became known as the school of Wadat al-Wujad, the oneness of being. He himself considered his writings to have been divinely inspired. As he expressed the way to one of his close disciples, his legacy is that you should never ever abandon your servanthood, Abudiyya, and that there may never be in your soul a longing for any existing thing. Junaid Baghdani Junaid Badadi 830-910 CE, was one of the great early Sufis, and is a central figure in the golden chain of many Sufi orders. He laid the groundwork for sober mysticism in contrast to that of God-intoxicated Sufis like al haloj Barazid Bastami and Abu Sayyid Abokai. During the trial of al haloj his former disciple, the Caliph of the time demanded his fatwa. In response, he issued this fatwa, from the outward appearance he is to die and we judge according to the outward appearance and God knows better. He is referred to by Sufis as Sayyidu Tafa, that is, the leader of the group. He lived and died in the city of Baghdad. Moinabin Chishti He was born in 1141 and died in 1236 CE. Also known as Garib Noor as benefactor of the poor, he is the most famous Sufi saint of the Chishti order of the Indian subcontinent. Moinuddin Chishti introduced and established the order in the subcontinent. The initial spiritual chain or silsila of the Chishti order in India, comprising Moinuddin Chishti, Bakhti or Khaki, Baba Farid, Nizamuddin Aliya, each successive person being the disciple of the previous one, constitutes the great Sufi saints of Indian history. Moinuddin Chishti turned towards India, reputedly after a dream in which Prophet Muhammad blessed him to do so. After a brief stay at Lahore, he reached Ajmer along with Sultan Shahabuddin Muhammad Ori, and settled down there. In Ajmer, he attracted a substantial following, acquiring a great deal of respect amongst the residents of the city. Moinuddin Chishti practiced the Sufi Sulh equal, peace to all, concept to promote understanding between Muslims and non-Muslims. Mansur al halai Mansur al haloj died 922 CE, is renowned for his claim Alna LHAQQ, I am the truth. His refusal to recant this utterance, which was regarded as apostasy, led to a long trial. He was imprisoned for 11 years in a Baghdad prison, before being tortured and publicly dismembered on March 26, 922. He is still revered by Sufis for his willingness to embrace torture and death rather than recant. It is said that during his prayers, he would say O oh Lord! You are the guide of those who are passing through the valley of bewilderment. If I am a heretic, enlarge my heresy. Reception Perception outside Islam Sufi mysticism has long exercised a fascination upon the Western world and especially its Orientalist scholars. Figures like Rumi have become well known in the United States, where Sufism is perceived as a peaceful and apolitical form of Islam. The Islamic Institute in Mannheim, Germany, which works towards the integration of Europe and Muslims, sees Sufism as particularly suited for interreligious dialogue and intercultural harmonization in democratic and pluralist societies. It has described Sufism as a symbol of tolerance and humanism, non-dogmatic, flexible and non-violent. Influence on Judaism Both Judaism and Islam are monotheistic. However, there is evidence that Sufism did influence the development of some schools of Jewish philosophy and ethics. A great influence was exercised by Sufism upon the ethical writings of Jews in the Middle Ages. In the first writing of this kind, we see Qatl al hadai ila varayit al-Qulab, Duties of the Heart, of Baya ibn Pakada. This book was translated by Judah ibn Tibbon into Hebrew under the title Havot ha-Levavot.
This was precisely the argument used by the Sufis against their adversaries, the Ulamas. The arrangement of the book seems to have been inspired by Sufism. Its ten sections correspond to the ten stages through which the Sufi had to pass in order to attain that true and passionate love of God which is the aim and goal of all ethical self-discipline. A considerable amount of Sufi ideas entered the Jewish mainstream through Bayer ibn Pakada's work, which remains one of the most popular ethical treatises in Judaism. It is noteworthy that in the ethical writings of the Sufis al-Khwazari and al-Harawi there are sections which treat of the same subjects as those treated in the Havot ha Lebabot, and which bear the same titles, for example, Bab al tawakkal Bab al-Tobar, Bab al muasabah Bab al-Tawadu, Bab al zud In the Ninth Gate, Baya directly quotes sayings of the Sufis, whom he calls Purushim. However, the author of the Havot Ha Levavot did not go so far as to approve of the asceticism of the Sufis, although he showed a marked predilection for their ethical principles. The Jewish writer Abraham Bahia teaches the asceticism of the Sufis. His distinction with regard to the observance of Jewish law by various classes of men is essentially a Sufic theory. According to it, there are four principal degrees of human perfection or sanctity. Namely, Abraham ben Moses ben Maimon, the son of the Jewish philosopher Maimonides, believed that Sufi practices and doctrines continue the tradition of the biblical prophets. See Sefer HaMaspeak, Ha Prishat, Chapter 11, Ha Mavak SV. Hitbun and Elifo be Maserat Mu Flair Zoo, citing the Armudic explanation of Jeremiah 13:27 in Chajiga 5b. In Rabbi Yankov in Selberg's translation, The Way of Serving God, Feldheim, pages 429 and above, pages 427. Also see Abid, Chapter 10, Ikkuvim, Sv Vahalo Yudla Altar. In The Way of Serving God, pages 371. There are other such references in Rabbi Abraham's writings, as well greater than he introduced in the Jewish prayer such practices as reciting God's names, dhikr. Abraham Maimuni's principal work is originally composed in Judeo-Arabic and entitled Ktbkpy al-Din Kutub Kafar al-Abidin, a comprehensive guide for the servants of God. From the extant surviving portion it is conjectured that Maimuni's treatise was three times as long as his father's guide for the perplexed. In the book, Maimuni evidences a great appreciation for, and affinity to, Sufism. Followers of his path continued to foster a Jewish Sufi form of pietism for at least a century, and he is rightly considered the founder of this pietistic school, which was centered in Egypt. The followers of this path, which they called, interchangeably, Hasidism, not to confuse with the latter Jewish Hasidic movement, or Sufism, to Zawuf, practiced spiritual retreats, solitude, fasting and sleep deprivation. The Jewish Sufis maintained their own brotherhood, guided by a religious leader, like a Sufi sheikh. Abraham Maimuni's two sons, Obadiah and David, continued to lead this Jewish Sufi brotherhood. Obadiah Maimonides wrote al muwalla al hordiya the treatise of the pool, an ethico-mystical manual based on the typically Sufi comparison of the heart to a pool that must be cleansed before it can experience the divine. The Maimonidian legacy extended right through to the 15th century with the fifth generation of Maimonidian Sufis, David ben Joshua Maimonides, who wrote al mashad Ila al-Tifarad, The Guide to Detachment, which includes numerous extracts of Suramadi's Kalimat at Tazawuf. In popular culture, films. In the Jewel of the Nile, 1985, the eponymous Jewel is a Sufi holy man. In Hideous Kinky, 1998, Julia, Kate Winslet, travels to Morocco to explore Sufism and a journey to self discovery. In Monsieur Ibrahim, 2003, Omar Sharif's character professes to be a Muslim in the Sufi tradition. Babaziz, 2005, a film by Tunisian director Naysha Kimir, draws heavily on the Sufi tradition, containing quotes from Sufi poets such as Rumi and depicting an ecstatic Sufi dance. Music 
Abid Parveen, a Pakistani Sufi singer is one of the foremost exponents of Sufi music, together with Nasrat Fatih Ali Khan are considered the finest Sufi vocalists of the modern era. Sanam Mavi another Pakistani singer has recently gained recognition for her Sufi vocal performances. A. R. Rahman, the Oscar-winning Indian musician, has several compositions which draw inspiration from the Sufi genre. Examples are the filmy Koalas Khwaja Mir Khwaja in the film Jadur Akbar, Ardzayan in the film Delhi Six and Khan Farah Khan in the film Rockstar. Bengali singer Lalan Fakir and Bangladesh's national poet Kazi Nazrul Islam scored several Sufi songs. Junoon, a band from Pakistan, created the genre of Sufi rock by combining elements of modern hard rock and traditional folk music with Sufi poetry. In 2005, Rabbi Shershal released a Sufi rock song called Bulaki Jana, which became a chart topper in India and Pakistan. Madonna, on her 1994 record Bedtime Stories, sings a song called Bedtime Story that discusses achieving a high unconsciousness level. The video for the song shows an ecstatic Sufi ritual with many dervishes dancing, Arabic calligraphy and some other Sufi elements. In her 1998 song Bittersweet, she recites Rumi's poem by the same name. In her 2001 Drowned World Tour, Madonna sang the song's secret showing rituals from many religions, including a Sufi dance. Singer-songwriter Lauriana McKennett's record The Mask and Mirror, 1994, has a song called The Mystic Stream that is influenced by Sufi music and poetry. The band Mavithatu has made references to Sufi parables, including the name of their album It's All Crazy. It's All False. It's All a Dream. It's All Right. 2009. Tori Amos makes a reference to Sufis in her song Cruel. Merk Deed is a Turkish composer who incorporates Sufism into his music and performances. Literature The Persian poet Rumi has become one of the most widely read poets in the United States, thanks largely to the interpretative translations published by Coleman Barks. Elif Suffolk's novel The Forty Rules of Love tells the story of Rumi becoming a disciple of the Persian Sufi dervish Shams Tabrizi. Modern and Contemporary Sufi Scholars Arabian Peninsula Abdullah bin Bayah, b. 1935, Saudi Arabia, Habib Ali al Jifri, b. 1971, Yemen, Habib Amar bin Hafiz, b. 1962, Yemen, Muhammad Alawi al Maliki, 1944 2004, Saudi Arabia. Levant in Africa ABD al Hamid Kishk. 1933-1996, Egypt, Abdul Qadir as Sufi, b. 1930, South Africa, Abd al Rahman al Shifari, 1912-2004, Syria, Ahmad al Alawi, 1869-1934, Algeria, Ahmad Tijani al Isis, b. 1955, Senegal, Ahmed al Tabe, b. 1946, Egypt, Ali Goma, b. 1951, Egypt, Amado Bamba, 1853-1927, Senegal, Jibril Haddad, b. 1960, Lebanon, Hassan Sis, 1945-2008, Senegal, Mohamed El Yaqabai, b. 1963, Syria, Mohamed Ibn Al Habib, 1876-1972, Morocco. Mohamed Said Tantori, 1928-2010, Egypt, New Harman Keller, b. 1954, Jordan, Shauki Ibrahim Abdel Karim Alam, Egypt, Mahba Zueli, b. 1932, Syria, Yusuf and Nibkani, 1849-1932, Palestine. Western Europe Abdel Hakim Murad, b. 1960. United Kingdom, Ahmed Babaka, United Kingdom, Frith Divshin, 1907-1998, Switzerland, Idris Shah, 1924-1996, United Kingdom, Llewellyn Vaughan Lee, b. 1953, 
United Kingdom, Martin Lings, 1909-2005, United Kingdom, Muhammad Imdid Hussein Pizada, B. 1946, United Kingdom. Eastern Europe. Hugh and Hill Music, 1911-2001, Turkey, Nazim Al Hakni, B. 1922, Turkey, Said Afendi Al Cherkawi, 1937-2012, Jestan, Said Nerzi, 1878-1960, Turkey. North America. Ahmed Tijani Ben Omar, B. 1950, United States, Hamd Sig Yusuf. B. 1960, United States, Hisham Kabani, B. 1945, United States, Hossein Nuz, B. 1933, United States, Kabir Helminski, B. 1942, United States, M. A. Mukhtar Khan, B. 1966, United States, Muhammad bin Yai al Ninawi, B. 1966, United States, Nadanga, B. 1945, United States, Noradin Durki, B. 1938, United States, Zaid Shaker, B. 1956, United States, Ali Kianfar, B. 1944, United States. South Asia Dr. Muhammad Ayar al Qadri, B. 1951, Pakistan, Ahmed Ullah Mazbandari, 1826-1906, Bangladesh, Ahmed Reza Khan, 1856-1921, India, Ukhtar Reza Khan, B. 1943, India, Khwaja Shamsuddin Hcme, B. 1927, Pakistan, Mayor Ali Shah. 1859-1937, Pakistan, Muhammad Abdul Qadir Siddiqui Qadri, 1871-1962, India, Muhammad Elias Qadri, B. 1950, Pakistan, Kalanda Baba Alia, 1898-1979, Pakistan, Kamarazaman Azmi, B. 1946, India, Serb Kibla Faltawli, 1913-2008, Bangladesh, Syed Ahid Ashraf, B. 1933, India, Tajuddin Muhammad Badruddin, 1861-1925, India, Thakur Shuib, B. 1930, India. Eastern and Central Asia Habib Munzir al Mazula, 1973-2013, Indonesia, Muhammad Abdul Alim Siddiqui, 1892-1954, Singapore, Muhammad Marjan, 1906-1978, China, Syed Muhammad Naquib Balatas, B. 1931, Malaysia. Gallery <laughs>